will take it. <laughs> now I have I do debate this material, and this is the this is part of the thesis of my doctorate uh, that we'll be introducing tonight. But some of the material that we're introducing tonight is the first time it's ever been introduced. So you're going to be the first to hear it. And that's why we're going to film it because this will go up on YouTube so that many people around the world who are waiting and watching to get this new material, they will get it. That's why we really wanted to do it here in Hong Kong. Uh, we want this to be the venue to not only spring this out as, as a springboard, but that, so this can be discussed in many venues around the world, not just here in Hong Kong. And uh, the topic, as you can see on the screen, is we're really looking at the Quran today, we're going, and we're asking the same questions of the Quran that have already been asked of the Bible. See, the Bible's gone through this test oh, for about 150 years, back in the 1800s, uh, when in Germany, at the University of Tübingen, people like Wellhausen and others who asked the, the historical questions of the Bible, <coughs> didactic criticism, source criticism, looking at the uh, documentary hypothesis. These are all well-known words. These are all well-known criticisms uh, that devastated the church, decimated the church in Europe. And by 1905, the church almost collapsed, along with Darwinianism and what we call historical criticism. Historical criticism is really biblical criticism. The only book that has gone through this kind of criticism has been the Bible. That's why almost everything I'm going to be using tonight comes out of that practice. And that's my area of expertise. I am a historical critic. And that's what I got my master's degree on. It's what I got my doctorate on. Now, what, as we have done that to the Bible, we are now doing it to other books. The Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita. The, many of the, the Book of Mormon. And now, finally, we're doing it to the Quran. Uh, this is why it's unfortunate that we couldn't do it at Hong Kong University. Of all places, that should be the one place that this should be asked. And if they're censoring us at Hong Kong University, then we're all having troubles. The fact that we have to come to a church to ask these questions is sad today, and I think it's unfortunate, because the one place that all of these questions have been asked have been on universities. And it started with the Bible, we're now moving into the Quran. Now, let's go ahead and start unpacking it and let's start going through it. When we look at the Bible and the Quran, the Christians don't make the same claims about the Bible that Muslims make about the Quran. For those of you who are taking notes, you can have this PowerPoint afterwards. I'll give it to you, okay? This is free. Uh, we don't charge anything. So if any of you do want this PowerPoint, just come up to me afterwards. We'll slap it onto the computer here and you can take it home so you don't wear out your hand because there's about 163 slides. We're going to go and find out. And I don't want you to get too tired. I'd rather you concentrate and then you can go and unpack it at your own time. So we don't ask, we don't make the claims about the Bible that Islam or Muslims have made about the Quran. Muslims will claim, first and foremost, that the Quran is eternal. When you look at the Quran, you have to look at Surah 85, Ayah 22. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, Surah means book, Ayah means verse. So book 85, verse 22, which says very clearly that this book comes from preserved tablets. Now, that may seem nebulous to most of us, but for the exegetes, for people like Al-Dabri, Zamakshari, Suyuti, and others, when they're talking about preserved tablets, they're talking about eternal tablets. So this book is derived from eternal tablets that have always existed. Therefore, it is inimitable. It is above criticism. That it was sent down to a man named Muhammad over a 23 period, 23 year period from 610 to 622. That's the other claim they make. Thirdly, that it was compiled completely at the during the time of Uthman the third caliph around 652 AD. So roughly 20 years after Muhammad's death because he died in 632. And then fourthly, that it is unchanged so that this book we have in our hands today is exactly the same book that has always existed from the time of Uthman in 652, from the time of Muhammad in, when he died in 632, and has always existed in heaven. That's the claim. Those are the four claims that Muslims make, whether they are radical, whether they are nominal, whether they are liberal, they would all, well, maybe not the liberals, but certainly the nominals and the radicals. 99% of all Muslims would make those four claims. Would we make those four claims as Christians? No, we wouldn't. Our Bible is not eternal. We know it's not. Well, was it sent out? No, it was not sent out. It was written by men. We know the men who wrote it. We give the names to many of the characters who wrote it. 
Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, Isaiah wrote Isaiah. We give the names to the men. We know it's written by men. It is inspired by God, yes, but not sent down via an angel Gabriel to a man, to 33 different men. No, we would, we would not make that claim. Thirdly, we would claim that in its original form, yes, it was complete. Yes, we would. But we don't have the originals today. Fourthly, we would be very clear that yes, it has changed. We know about 40 verses that are in doubt. And we make, we're very clear. If you look at my Bible here, you go to the last part of Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, verse 19 to 22. It says very clearly, and there's a line being, uh, on my Bible that informs the reader that these verses are not found in the earliest Greek manuscripts. And we're very honest about that. We're very transparent about it. Christians have always been transparent about that. If you go to John chapter 7, verse 53, to John 8, 11, there's a line before that verse and a line after those group of verses that say very clearly in the Sinaiticus and the Alexandrinus and the Vaticanus, all of these manuscripts that are in London, uh, that are in Rome, these manuscripts don't have those set of verses, those nine verses. We're very clear about that. First John chapter 7, verse uh, First John chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Verse 7 has been taken out of most Bibles because it should not be there. It was added in England, of all places, your country, uh, for the King James Version in about the 60, uh, 1500. So we are very clear, we're very open, and we do not try to hide that. So we would make that fourth claim. Yes, it's been changed, but we know exactly where it's been changed. And the reason why is because we have so many thousands of manuscripts to refer to. We have 5,300 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin Vulgates, 9,000 in other languages. That's around, roughly around 24,000 manuscripts that we can look at in order to know what our Bible is. And we've compared all of them together, and that's pretty much why we know exactly what belongs and what doesn't, what has been added or what has been accreted, what has been deleted. That has not yet been done to the Quran, except tonight, we're gonna do that. We're going to ask and do the same, the same um, uh, work that has been done on the Bible, we're going to do of the Quran. So, therefore, we need only look at the three Muslim claims, eternal, sent down, and unchanged. We're going to look at those. And that fact, we're going to do more of that. What we're going to do, and my remit tonight is this. I don't have to prove whether the Bible or the Quran is the word of God. I leave that up to you. That's for you to decide. I'm not here to try to impose that on you. You've got to make that decision, every one of you sitting in this room tonight, which truly is the word of God. My sole purpose tonight is to prove that the Quran we have today, this book here, this is known as the Hus manuscript. This is the Hus copy. This is the 1924 Quran. That this book that I have in my hand today, <coughs> All we have to ask is, we're gonna to prove today that this book does not come from Muhammad. It does not come from the third caliph Uthman. It was not compiled completely during the time of Uthman in 652. In fact, I'm gonna to prove today that this book didn't even exist in the seventh century. All right, listen to me. Muhammad died in 632. He started receiving revelations in 610, the early seventh century. I'm gonna to prove today that this book is not, does not even exist in the seventh century in its complete form. And I'm gonna to prove today that this book was written not by God, does not come from God, does not come from Muhammad, but it comes from men, like you and me. Was intentionally changed throughout the last 1300 years, and is basically only 93 years old. Let me repeat that. The Quran that we have in our hand today is only 93 years old. Created, finalized, canonized, in 1924 at Al-Azhar University in Egypt. All right, let's go ahead and let's see how I'm gonna do that. Now, let's ask what the Muslims say. This is what they say, this is from the Hadith, the Mishkat al-Masabi, uh, page 664. The Quran is the greatest wonder among the wonders of the world. This book is second to none in the world according to the unanimous decision of the learned men in points of diction, style, rhetoric, thoughts, and sounds of laws, and regulations to shape the destinies of mankind. Now, that's quite a bit to say in one. Paragraph. They're making all kinds of claims to say that. In other words, it's superior to every other revelation is what they're saying. Secondly, they say that 
will they say Muhammad hath forged it? Answer, bring therefore a chapter like unto it, and call whom ye to your assistance besides Allah, if ye speak truth. That's in Surah 1090, uh, verses 37 and 38, chapter 2, verse 23, and chapter 17, verse 88. Based on what they're saying, there is no other book that can equal this. There's nothing that comes close to this. It's the mother of all books, according to Surah 43, verses 3 and 4. So what we're going to do tonight is investigate seven areas. We're going to start with the compilation. How was this book put together? What do Muslims tell us? How do, what, does the, what do the traditions tell us concerning how this book was put together? We're going to look at internal anachronisms, historical anachronisms. We're going to look at source criticism. Where did many of the stories in the Quran come from? We're going to especially look at manuscript criticism, and this is going to be the most damaging, the manuscript critique. And we're going to look at ancient corrections. That will be equally damaging. This is new material that's just coming to the fore in the last two years. And then we're going to look at modern corrections. This is material that's just come to the fore in the last 12 months. And then we're going to end up with the Birmingham folio, the claim that that is the, the original Quran, the one that was found in Birmingham back in 2015. All right, now, problem number one. Let's start with, start with compilation. How did this book get put together? How was it compiled? To do that, we're going to uh, look at why was it compiled, when was it compiled, who compiled it, where was it compiled, what was compiled, and how was it compiled. So we're going to try to get through each one of those. So let's move right on. What Muslims tell us, they say in order to, in order to understand how this book was compiled, we need to start and look and see what Al-Buhari. Al-Buhari is the most authoritative of the Hadith writers. He's writing in the late 9th century. He died, he died in 870, and this is what he says concerning how the Quran was compiled. You need to go to al Buhari, volume 6, hadith number 509 and 510. Now, there you can see the Arabic on the right, and there is the translation on the left. I have, rather than go through the entire translation on the left, I've just summarized there on your screen. In 650, Uthman, that's the third caliph, you have Abu Bakr, you have Umar, and then you have Uthman, who rules from 6, 646 to around 661. Uthman, I'm sorry, to 656, Ali that takes over from 656 to 661. So he's the third of the four rightly guided caliphs. And in 650, he did not have the entire corrected Quran text at hand. So as al-Buhari's inmates, a large part of the Quran may be lost. This was the concern at the time of Uthman. For Uthman then orders three to help Zayd ibn Thabi. Who is Zayd ibn Thabi? He is the secretary of Muhammad. He is the one that wrote the first recension. He is the one that first wrote down the first copy of the Quran, roughly around 632 to 634. And that's what we're talking about. To revise the codex of Hasna, daughter of Umar, and correct it where necessary, even recalling a verse, chapter 33, verse 23, which had been missing from the original text. The next hadith then goes on from there, 510. Uthman takes Hafsa's copy. So here we are. Let me just give the scenario. You have back there in 632 and 634, immediately after Muhammad's death, you have the Battle of Yamama. The Battle of Yamama, many of those who had memorized the Quran died in that battle. And so they, uh, both uh, Abu Bakr and Umar come together and they're, they're concerned because if all of them died, then of course the Quran will be lost. It had not been written down at the time of Muhammad's death. Some of it had been written on stones, some of it had been written on bones, some of it had been written on, on leaves, stocks, but others, much of it had been memorized by the companions of the prophet. But it was not in a codified form. It was not in a codex. It was not in a book like this at, at the time of Muhammad's death. So that's why Abu Bakr and Umar had Zayd ibn Thabi, the secretary of Muhammad, to then write down that first copy between 632 and 634. Are you, are you following that? That copy was given to Hafsa, one of the wives of Muhammad. She, according to tradition, she put it under her bed and left it there for about 20 years. Now we move into 652, 20 years later. Uthman is now caliph, and at this time he is concerned because there are other there are other copies of the Quran that are in existence. And so he has Zaid ibn Thabi take Hafsa's copy, bring it to the courts there. And there, at that point, he has them to rewrite the Quran along with three friends, Alas, Zubair, and Ali. The four of them rewrite the Quran in the Quraysh dialect. That's what it says in 510. If they disagreed, Uthman says, then make sure you write it in the Quraysh dialect. 
Shall they write it? That's the final, that's then now becomes the canonical text. Are you following me so far? I've seen mostly say, yeah, nodding. Okay. Once that Quran is finished, according to what we read here, Uthman then sends one copy of this Quran to all the provinces of that time. We know that there were nine provinces. There was a province in Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Aden, Herat, and Nishapur. So that's nine different cities, nine different provinces. That means there were nine of these books sent to nine different provinces for safekeeping and also so that these would be the official text for all the provinces. And then look and see what he does. After he sends it to the nine provinces, then, oh, it's right off the screen. We can't even see it at the bottom of the screen here. But it says, all those, whether in written and fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, must be burnt. They burnt all the residual manuscripts. Now, it's not me saying this. This is what Abu Hadi says in the ninth century, referring to what happened back in the seventh century. Now, here are the questions that I have. First and foremost, why is it that we even need a Quran? And if we do need a final revelation, why didn't God choose a language which could not accommodate the Quran? In other words, take a look at the Quran and look at it. You'll see when we show you the, all the earliest manuscripts, there are no diacritical marks on any of them and there's no vowelization. That means there's no dots above and below the lines and there's no dama kasra or fatah, the u, the a, the e sound. These don't exist on the earliest manuscripts, which means Arabic was so crude at that time in the seventh century, it could not accommodate a revelation from God to begin with. So why would God in his wisdom even choose Arabic? That's the first question I have. Did he not have other languages he could have chosen? Yes, he had Hebrew. He already had Greek. That was where the New Testament was written in. There were many languages that are much older than Arabic and could have accommodated this text. So why did God use the languages he had already used it previously? That's the second question. Furthermore, why didn't God choose a man who could read and write? Why in the world did he choose someone who was illiterate? For the greatest revelation in the history of mankind, you would have think God would have chosen someone who could read and write that book. And if Muhammad could not read and write, why didn't he learn to read and write? He had 23 years to do it. It doesn't take long to read or write Arabic. I've had two years of it. Many of you probably can read and write Arabic. Certainly, if that was his major mission, if that was his sole mission on earth to receive the Quran and give it to the world, then why in the world didn't he learn to read it and write it? And then why didn't he write it down before he died? That's rather negligent of him. More than that, if he refused to read and write and he didn't want to read and write, he had a secretary named Zaid ibn Thabi. Why didn't he have Zaid ibn Thabi write it down? What are secretaries for if they're not to write down what the person who they're being a secretary for requires. 23 years, Zayed Ibn Thabit was sitting there doing nothing. These questions we need to ask, and I've never heard anybody ask these questions before. Yet, to me, that's their perfectly natural questions to ask. Then we get to Abu Bakr. Why did not Abu Bakr make copies of the first recension? Why did he make the copies that Uthman did later on? And why didn't he send them to the nine provinces in 634? So this would not have been a problem. There would not have been a multiplicity of crowns. Why in the world did the one copy that Zayd ibn Thabit then finally put together in 634 was put under the bed of Hafsa and left for 20 years? What's the reason in that? Now these are legitimate questions for me to ask. And they're not very difficult as you can see. These are as simplistic as you can get. Why did Uthman find me, when he did get the second recension, the final copy put together, why did Uthman then burn all the copies? Doesn't that suggest that all those that were burnt disagreed? Am I correct? And we're not talking about diacritical marks because these didn't even exist in the 8th century, I mean, in the 7th century. We're not talking about vowelization. Therefore, we're not talking about dialogical differences. This has nothing to do with Ahruf or Giryat as many Muslims would like to suggest, and maybe some of you in the audience will try to come back to me on that. If this was Kirya and Ahruf, then you're not talking about Razan, you're not talking about consonantal text. For those of you who are Arab speakers, 
In order to have up group and kidyat, you have to have the arithmetical marks. In order to have different readings, you have to have vowelizations. Those were only incorporated into the Arabic text in the late 8th century, and we're talking about the 7th century. Are you following me? I know I'm getting a little bit technical here because this is being filmed, and I know thousands of Muslims are going to watch this. So I want to make sure that they understand where I'm heading with this. And then where are the copies? Well, before we do that, wouldn't it have been nice if Uthman had left the, the Qurans there rather than burn them so we could look at them today? like we do with the Bible. Have Christians ever burnt any Bibles? Do we burn any manuscripts at all? Have you known of any historical period where Christians have burned their own manuscripts? No, the Romans burned our manuscripts. We know that. During the Edict of Diocletian in 300 AD, manuscripts were burned. But Christians have never burned any manuscripts. We keep everything in place so that anybody can look at it or as transparent as you can get. That's why we have 24,000 that are still existing today. 230 of them pre-exist the 6th century. They're not all complete, but we do have complete manuscripts, like the Sinaiticus in the British Library, where I've spent the last 25 years, not the British Library, but in Britain, in London. If you look at that, that's an incomplete manuscript, and it's 400 years before the first Quran. Right next to it in the British Library is the Alexandrinus, which is from the 5th century. Both the Old and New Testament. That's 200 years. Did I say 400 years? 300 years before the Quran, and the Alexandrians is 200 years. So when we look at like with like, just look at the mass of manuscripts we can refer to and how why you're going to see after tonight, Islam has no legs to stand up when it comes to manuscript evidence. Then I ask the, probably the most damaging question Where are the copies of the Quran sent to the nine cities? Where are the nine copies today? We're only talking about 1,400 years ago. Why can't we find one of those nine copies? Muslims have tried to say, well, they were burned, or they were in floods, or there was lots of violence. Eight of those cities have always been controlled by Muslims for 1,400 years. Only Jerusalem has been taken back. There is no excuse not to have those nine manuscripts. We're only talking about 1,400 years ago. And why, if Uthman standardized the Quran to one copy, are there now a multiplicity of Qurans today? We're going to get to that and see what I'm talking about. Let's go on. Now, so what did early Islamic traditions tell us about the Quran? This is what they tell us. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to the Islamic sources. This is, these are all Islamic sources. This is coming from Al Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Dawud, Tirmidhi. These are the most authoritative hadith compilers. I'm just going to show you what they tell us about how the Quran was compiled. And what they say is, well, let's start with Ibn Dawud. Many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama, but they were not known by those who survived them, nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. That's Ibn Abi Dawud admitting that some of the verses were lost. You have here, oops, I went too fast. You have here, uh, as Suyuti. It is reported from the Ismail ibn Ibrahim, from Ayyub ibn Nafi, from Uma, ibn Umar, who said, Let none of you say, I have acquired the whole of the Quran. How does he know what all of it is when much of the Quran has disappeared? Rather, let him say, I have acquired what has survived. Now, that's an enormous admission right there from one of the largest and most authoritative scholars of Islam who makes that <coughs> reference. Now we have Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim says, we used to recite a surah which they resembled in length and severity to Surah Baraa. I have, however, forgotten it, with the exception of this, which I remember of it, and he refers to what he said. So here, Sahih Muslim, the second most authoritative of the Hadith writer, admits that some of the Quran has been forgotten. Others of the Quran have been cancelled, according to Sahih Muhadi. We used to read a verse of the Quran revealed in the connection, but later the verse was cancelled. And then we have some of the verses went missing, according to, again, Al Buhari. And amongst what Allah revealed was the verse of the Rajam, that's the verse on stoning. We did recite this verse and understood and memorized it. Allah's apostle did carry out the punishment of stoning, and we, so did we after him. And there is an interesting admission. I am afraid that after a long time has passed, somebody will say by Allah, we do not find the verse of Rajam in Allah's book. And that's true. When you go to chapter 24, verse 2, you will find out there's a hundred lashes for those who commit adultery, not stoning any longer. That's the verse of Rajam that has been taken out and has been replaced. 
Other verses were overlooked. Kuzayma, Ibn Thabit said, I see you have overlooked two verses and have not written them down. And that's found in Ibn Abi Dawud. And others have been changed. Here we come back to Muatta, Ibn Malik. According to Aisha, Aisha ordered, uh, Aisha, the favorite wife of Muhammad, ordered me to transcribe the Holy Quran and asked me to let her know when I should write at this verse. She ordered, write it in this way. She had heard it this way from Apostle of Allah. So even a wife of Muhammad has a verse changed because she found it different than what she remembered. Altogether, al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf made 11 modifications in the reading of the Uthmanic text, according to, and, uh, but it was altered to so and so, according to Ibn Abi Dawud. And then we have some verses were substituted, according to Sahih Bukhari again. We substitute something better or similar. And then finally, some verses were even eaten by a shirk. <laughs> verse of stoning and about breastfeeding an adult 10 times was revealed and the paper was with me under my pillow. When the messenger Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death and a tame sheep came and ate it. Now, these are from Islamic traditions. I'm not making this up. All of these you can find. Every one of these you can go back and trace. So certainly what Muslims are saying today is not what the earliest Muslims said. Lost, disappeared, forgotten, canceled, missing, overheard, changed, modified, substituted, eaten by sheep. Does this sound like a book which was compiled perfectly and completely? Does this not imply intentional human intervention all through its compilation? And that's what I'm proving tonight. In its compilation, it looks like much of it has been manipulated by humans. And again, if you notice, I've been only using Islamic authority, Islamic text to prove my point. Now we get to the second problem, historical anachronisms. The claim by Muslims is that the Quran is perfect, does not contain any errors, as the eternal word of God that being such. It has no history, it has no intentional human interventions, and thus historical criticism created for the Bible does not apply to the Quran. This is what my Muslims have told me for the last 35 years that I've been working in Islam. This is what I've heard over and over again. Historical criticism is not a problem for the Quran. It is only a problem for the Bible. Well, let's take a look. When we look at the Quran, we find that it introduces a Samaritan way, way too early. In Surah chapter 20, verse 85 to 87, also 95 to 97, it says, But indeed we have tried your people after you departed, and the Samadhi has led them astray. So Moses returned to his people, angry and grieved. Moses said, And what is your case, O Samidi? Samidi is the name for Samaritans in Arabic. Now the problem is Samaritans did not exist at the time of Abraham, I'm sorry, of Moses in 1400 BC. The Samaritans were created by Sargon II the Assyrian king in 722, 700 years later. So here's a historical anachronism that is quite common of the Quran. When the Quran borrows stories, it borrows, the, it puts the individuals in the wrong place. Now let's go back. The mosque that we have here, a mosque that has a mosque to early in Surah 17, Ayah 1. Glorified is he who took his slave for a journey by night from the Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. This is known as the Miraj, 621. When Muhammad was woken up in the middle of the night, told to get on the back of the Burak, the winged horse, and he flew on the winged horse up to Jerusalem. And there at the dome, where the dome of the rock is today, where the rock was at that time, where it, which was known as the Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, according to the Quran, he then flew up to the seven heavens. Now the problem with that is there was no Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem at that time. That, didn't, that was not built until 710 AD. This is 621 AD. If they want to say it's the Dome of the Rock, that was built in 691 AD. Can you see the problem? That's 70 years later. You cannot have a mosque in Jerusalem that early. There were no Muslims in Jerusalem that early. There was no mosque that early in Jerusalem. If you want to call it the temple, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So there was no temple there either. So where is this Masjid Al-Aqsa in Surah 17, Ayah 1? In Surah 34, Ayah 10 to 11, it says, And we certainly gave David, we made pliable for him, iron. Make full coats of mail and calculate precisely the links, assuming that there was chain mail at the time of David, who lived in 1000 BC. Coats of chain mail were not invented till 200 BC, a full 800 years later. You cannot have it that early. The Quran assumes crucifixion much too early. In chapter 7, verse 120 to 124, you have Sarah, I'm sorry, Pharaoh, saying to the sorcerers who were trying to keep up with Moses. Moses was doing all these different signs, these different plagues. And so the sorcerers were trying to keep up with them, and they could not. And so 
Pharaoh takes the sorcerers and crucifies them. Well, we know that Moses was living in 1400 BC. In Surah 12, Ayah 41, the Pharaoh of that time takes the baker who was in prison with Joseph, takes him out of prison and crucifies him. Now we know that Joseph lived in 1800 BC. Here's the problem. There was no crucifixion that early. Crucifixion was invented in 500 BC. Do you see the difficulty? That's over a thousand or 1300 years later. And so the Quran makes these kind of historical anachronisms over and over again, which suggests to me that if you're gonna get it right, at least get it right with the crucifixion of Jesus. But then it denies the crucifixion of Jesus. In chapter 4, 157, and they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption, and they did not kill him. Now, we do know that historically, almost every historian of the first and second century agreed that that was Jesus on the cross. Thallus, a Greek historian, was debating Phlegon in 52 AD. That was, that's within 20 years of Christ's death. They were having a debate about the death of Jesus Christ. They mentioned that with the day that Jesus died, the earth shook and the sun went dark, supporting exactly what we see in the Matthew account. So there you have Greek historians that agree with the crucifixion. Lucian was a Greek satirist who, in the second century, talks about cruc the crucifixion of Christ. Marabar Sarapin's letter to the pagan in 73 AD refers specifically to the death of Jesus Christ. Josephus was a Jew. He was a Jewish historian, right? Between 80, uh, 37 AD and 90 AD, in the late sec first century, he not only talks about the death of Jesus Christ, he mentions curiously that the Christians believe that he rose again. It's the only non-Christian reference we have to the resurrection. And then you have Tacitus. Tacitus hated Christians, had nothing good to say about Christians. Yet Tacitus, in the beginning of the second century, talks about the death of Jesus Christ and gives us the date for it because he says it happens during the time, the time of Pontius Pilate under the authority of Tiberius. That's why we know today that it happened in 33 AD. Thank God for Tacitus. Though he did not agree at all with what Jesus was or what he said or what he did, he did agree that he did die on the cross. So you have Greek historians, you have Jewish historians, you have Roman historians, all from the first and second century, all agreeing that that was Jesus on the cross. Show me any historian that disagrees. Until you get to the Quran, 600 years later, a man who could even read and write in a language that he couldn't even accommodate what he was saying, then suddenly gets a new revelation that Christ was not on the cross. That's in Surah 4, 157, but if you go to Surah 19, Ayah 33, Jesus himself, or Issa himself, talks about his death and resurrection as a little child. Blessed be me, the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I rise again, completely confronting Surah 4, Ayah 157. I leave that for the Muslims to deal with. What about Mary? Surah 19, Ayah 28. Mary is the sister of Aaron. In Surah 66, Ayah 12, Mary is the daughter of Imran. In Surah 20, Ayah 30, Aaron is Moses' brother. But Mary, all the way through, is the mother of Jesus. How can you have Jesus' mother, who could be the sister of Aaron and the daughter of Amran, who is Amran in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 6 verse 20. Now we do know that both Aaron and Moses had a, had a sister named Miriam, but she lived in 1400 BC and she could not be simultaneously the mother of Jesus because otherwise she was 1400 years old and I don't think Mary was that old. It looks like the Quran confuses the two Marys and confuses and assumes therefore that the Mary of the, of the time of Moses is the same Mary, the mother of Jesus. So I'm saying, well, no, no, that, that uh, Mary's father is Amram. That's not true. When you look at Luke chapter 3, it's very clear that the father of Mary is Eli. It comes from a completely different line than the father of Jacob, who is the father of Joseph. Now, it confuses the Kibla and the Kaaba. The Kibla, Surah 2, I 144 to 149, from 624, all the Kiblas should be facing towards Mecca. Yet we now find four different Kiblas. I'm not going to unpack this tonight. Come on the Saturday. We're going to show you how 
uh, in Torrey, Kentucky. In fact, we're going to look at the kiblas. We're going to show you about 65 kiblas that are facing the wrong way. That we're going to introduce on Saturday. So come and uh, rather than talk about it tonight, look and see what we now know about Muhammad and about Mecca. We're going to show you that there was no Mecca at all. None existed at the time of Muhammad. Wait till you see what we have now found concerning Mecca. But that's for Saturday, so I'm not going to unpack that too much today. Including the Kaaba in Mecca, we'll talk more about that on Saturday. It confuses Pharaoh, the Tower of Babel, and Haman. Surah 28, I 38. The Pharaoh said, Oh, so kindle me for me, Haman. Haman? In Egypt? Surah 40, I 36 and 37. Pharaoh said, Oh, Haman, construct for me a tower. Haman building a tower? First of all, Egypt, they never did build towers. They built pyramids and temples. We don't know of any reference to towers in Egypt. That was another problem. But in Genesis 11, 1 to 9, the tower is in Chaldea, in southern Iraq, hundreds of miles away. Haman is not even an Egyptian name. It's a Persian name. And we find it in Esther, chap Esther chapter 3, verse 1, where Haman was the minister of the Persian king, Ahasuerus, who is churches, one according to the Greeks, and reigned between 486 and 465. Pharaoh was in 1500 BC. Haman lived in 510 BC. They therefore never met each other because they lived over a thousand years apart. Are you seeing the problem here? These are anachronisms that Muslims have not yet been able to answer. Then when you get to do al Qadamai, who's Alexander the Great, in chapter 18, verse 19, 6, he goes and he brings me a sheet of iron, he says, and he builds this between two mountains, a wall made out of iron with molten copper put over top. Now, if you build a wall made out of iron with molten Colton, uh, copper over top to keep the enemies from getting through, that's a pretty substantial wall, wouldn't you suggest? Why is it no one has heard about this wall? It would be the greatest engineering achievement in the history of mankind. Even today, we can't build walls of iron between two mountains. Yet, according to the Quran, this is exactly what Alexander the Great did in 300 BC. Alexander the Great had three different biographers who talked about his life. Nowhere in any of the three biographies is there any reference to a wall between two, diff two different mountains. It refers, uh, refers to futuristic coin, the dirham, 0 to 12 by 20, talking about Joseph being sold for a few years and counted out. Now, Joseph lived in 1800 BC. Coins didn't even exist at the time of Joseph. They were created by the Lydians in the 7th century BC, over a hundred uh, thousand years later. The dirham, ironically, did not exist at the time of Muhammad. So how could Muhammad have even talked about a dirham? There were no dirhams at the time. There were drachmas. There were Greek drachmas. There were Persian drachmas. Now Muslims have said, well, this is the this is the Arabic name for drachma. No, there was there was no Arabic name for drachmas. They used the word drachma at that time. But dirhams were then introduced in 661. But Muhammad died in 632. This is 30 years later. It's as if I were to come to you, Paul, you're a British man, and I say back in 1960, I would have loved to have bought your coat for uh, 20 euros. It would have made no sense in 1960 to talk about euros. Euros didn't exist in 1960, but they do today. Can you see the problem? That's why you need to look at this as another uh, anachronism. Interestingly, the Bible gets it completely correct. In chapter 37 of Genesis, it says that Joseph was sold for 20 shekels. Shekels is the right denomination. It is a weighted measure. It is 0.2% of kilos of a silver, proving that not only is the Bible correct, but it also we know from the Nuzi tablets and the Mari tablets that the price of a slave in 1800 BC was exactly 20 shekels. The Bible gets the right denomination, gets the right price of the slave, the right man at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. And we don't even ask the Bible to do that. It just turns out the Bible is correct, but then I'm not surprised. Conclusion. The authors of the Quran do not know history. God would not make these mistakes. Further proof, these are intentionally human interventions. That's number two. Let's go to number three. Source criticism. Now, what source problems existed? According to Muslims, this is what they claim. The Quran is the eternal word of God. Its source comes from eternal tablets, preserved in heaven, chapter 85, verse 22. It was revealed to correct the errors of previous revelations. It is unfettered by human intervention. In other words, it does not come from that. I, I, I hope that the other Muslims don't walk out. We do need the Muslims to stay. They need to listen to this. I just saw a Muslim walk out. We do need the Muslims to stay because I want them to react to what I'm saying tonight, okay? It's important that you do. 
So what are the source problems? When you take a look at the Quran, you will find that there are many stories in the Quran that talk about biblical characters. What's interesting is when you look at the biblical characters, you look at the stories that are there, they are not the same stories that we have in the Bible. And this has always been a curiosity for those of us who are Christians and Jews. Why is it they don't have the same stories? We now know the reason. In almost every case, 25% of the Quran is borrowed. We know where they borrowed them from, we know who they borrowed them from, and we pretty well know the documents that they borrowed them from. And I'm, rather than go through all the hundreds of them that we could go, I'm not going to give you them, I'm just going to give you two or three. In chapter 5, verse 32, we ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a person, unless it be for murder of mischief, spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people, and if anyone saved the life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. This is one of the favorite verses that is bandied around by Muslims, by Ahmadiyyas, am I correct? Ahmadiyyas love this verse, because it's the one verse on peace you can find in the Quran. The problem is it doesn't belong in the Quran. We know exactly where it comes from. If you were to go to the verse before it, it's the story of Cain and Abel. <coughs> Cain kills his brother Abel, doesn't know what to do with the body of, of his brother, and so he watches the raven burying his partner, and he follows the example of the raven and buries his brother. Then you get this verse, which follows it. O children of Israel, which means it has nothing to do with Muslims. This is for Jews. He who takes the blood of one, it's if he takes the blood of all, but he who saves the blood of one, is if he saved the blood of all. This is a redemption analysis on the blood of Abel. And it was written, first of all, the story of Cain and Abel we have found in the Targum of Jonathan ben Uzziah, which is a, a second century apocryphal account. Look at the date, second century AD, long after the Bible was already canonized. So it was written by Jews about the blood of Abel. It wasn't until the fifth century AD that this a, a scribe who was copying over the Targum of John ben, ben Uzziah wrote in the margin in his own pen, he who takes the blood of one as if he takes the blood of all. He who saves the blood of one as if he saves the blood of all. It was nothing more than a scribe, probably basically editorializing about the blood of Abel. In the late fifth century, when the Bar Sanhedrin was written by the Jews, the story of Cain and Abel, along with the analysis of the blood of Abel, was then incorporated into the same story in chapter 4, verse 5. We know when it was written, we know who wrote it, we know why it was written. It has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with, really, with anybody other than those Jewish scribes that wrote it. And yet then it gets incorporated into the Quran, somewhere in the 7th or 8th or 9th century. What's fascinating, if you want to find out what you're supposed to do, Read the very next verse that follows it, verse 33, because that verse has not to do with Jews. It has to do with anybody who does not follow Muhammad or does not follow Allah. We must be crucified and have our hands and feet cut off on opposite end. That follows verse 32. That's to do with us, not verse 32. That's to do with Jews. Are you following me? Now, let's look at Surah uh, 5, verse... Sorry, that, take that 5 out of that's a misprint. Chapter 27, verse 17 to 44. In chapter 27, verse 74, you have an interesting story of Solomon and Sheba. Solomon has birds that he, basically, he keeps them and marches them every day so they can fly up into battle and drop stones on their enemies. And on the bottom of every stone is the name of the enemy they're gonna kill. The first Air Force ever invented was by Solomon. I had no idea. <laughs> one day, as he's marching his birds, he noticed that one of the birds is missing. It's called that because you go, hoo -hoo, hoo -hoo. we have an Indian, I grew up with these hoo birds. And he was angry that the hoo bird wasn't there marching with him. Then he sees the bird flying in from the south and it lands at his feet and he talks to the bird. I had no idea Solomon could talk to birds. But this bird said that way down in the south, in the land of Sheba, there's a gorgeous queen, that he must go see the queen. Well, he's busy marching his bird, so he sends the bird on back down to the uh, land of Sheba to bring her back to feed him. And the bird lands at the feet of the queen of Sheba and talks to her. Lo and behold, the Queen of Sheba talks to birds. I had no idea, but there it is in the Quran. As she's talking to the bird, the bird wants her to come up to meet Solomon, so she comes up with her retinue, comes up to Solomon's temple, I'm sorry, palace, comes in the door where he's in his throne room, and walks, starts walking across towards Solomon, and she looks down and she sees a pond with a glass over it. She doesn't know the glass is there. She thinks she's gonna get her feet wet, so she pulls up her skirt to keep her feet from getting wet, her skirts from getting wet. And that's where the story ends in verse 44. Have you heard this story before? Is this story in the Bible? I missed it in Sunday school. What a lovely story. 
Why is it we never had this in Sunday school? Well, for one very good reason. It's not in the Bible. And the reason it's not in the Bible is because it has nothing to do with the Bible. It is an apocryphal account. It is the second Targum of Esther written in the second century by Jews in the diaspora, basically as a bedtime tale for their children. Never considered to be part of scripture. It was nothing more than entertainment. And yet this story makes its way into the Quran in Surah 27, Ayah 17 to 44. This is why you have to do source criticism on the Quran or any religious book that claims to be historical as the Quran does. When you look at Surah 3, Ayah 35 to 37, Mary, Imran, Jared, uh, Zechariah, that comes from Proto-Evangelion uh, Evangelion's James the Lesser. That's a sectarian account written by Christians, not Christians, did I say Christians? Gnostic writers. This is Gnostic accounts, and yet it makes its way into the Quran. The story of Jesus creating birds out of clay in uh, Surah 3, Ayah 49, that comes from Thomas' Gospel of the Infancy of Jesus Christ, again, a Gnostic account written in the 2nd century. Bearing the ring that I talked about earlier, the Targum John of ben that comes in the 2nd century. Chapter 7, verse 171, of raising of mountains, that comes from the Abadassara, which is again, a Jewish apocryphal account. And then when Jesus talks as a baby and he tells his mother how to eat fruit from a, from a tree, that is not in our Bible because that comes from the first gospel of the infancy of Jesus Christ, another Gnostic writing. These are Gnostic writings. These are not Christian writings. They were always rejected by the Christians. They were never accepted. Interestingly, the Gnostics and many of these sectarian uh, groups, which were heretical, drew, were drew, driven out of the Byzantine world and they were sent down to Arabia. They were sent down primarily to places like Baghdad today, which was called Stephon in the uh, our archaic days. It's no wonder then that the Arabs or the Persians who put the Quran together, as I'm going to say later on, they came across only these stories. So can you now understand why these stories are incorporated into the Quran and not the authoritative stories from the Bible? The reason why the stories from the Bible are not in the Quran is because the Bible was not translated into Arabic until the late 8th century. Are you hearing me? This book was not translated into Arabic until the late 8th century. Therefore, the Arabs never read the Bible. They never had access to these stories. They only had access to these sectarian accounts, these apocryphal accounts. And that's why 25% of the Quran is full of these accounts. Written in Syriac. If you look at the beautiful poetry, Muslims tell me all the time, one of the gorgeous things about the Quran is its poetry. How could a man who could not read or write put together such beautiful poetry? Two scholars, Dr. Gunther Luni and Dr. Luxembourg, two of them independent of each other, who are both Syriac scholars, upon reading these, this poetry, recognize that they've read these before. Dr. Gunther Luni went back to find out where these this poetry came from. And he noticed that almost every one of the poetry that you find in the Quran can be traced back to pre-Islamic Christian hymns written in Syriac in the 5th and 6th century. Strophe by strophe, exactly the same. Borrow them from the Syriac, interpose into the Quran, and interpose into Arabic. And most of these stories do refer to Issa. But the name for Jesus in Syriac is Iesu. When you take the story of Jesus in Syriac and you interpose it into Arabic, it becomes Issa. This is not my Jesus, folks. That's why Issa is the wrong name for Jesus. It's not even an Arabic name. It's a Syriac name. They've got the wrong Jesus. They've got the wrong name. They've got the wrong man at the wrong place, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. My Jesus did not make birds out of clay and blow on them as a baby. He did not tell Mary how to eat, and he did not speak from the cradle, like the Quran has full of. And my Jesus did die on the cross, and he rose again. What a Jesus we've got. The Quran's got it completely wrong, but then you can see why. It went to the wrong source. Once again, we are proving these are all written by finite men and not from God. That's all I'm proving tonight, have you noticed? That's number three, let's go to number four. Now we get into the real material. This is the most difficult for Muslims to deal with. This is why a lot of Muslims did not want to come tonight because of this material. This is why they were putting, I don't know if you saw, they were putting out he had a leaflets to stop people from coming to the meeting tonight. Because the manuscript material is by far the most devastating. This material I introduced in 2014. 
In 2014, I was given this material. We came across it in London, and I challenged Dr. Shabir Ali, considered to be the Muslim world's uh, best debater, to a debate on it. We debated in September of 2014. He let me go first, which is his undoing. He should never have let me go first. <laughs> if you want to watch the debate, you can go up on YouTube, put the great debate, Dr. J uh, Shabir Ali versus J. Smith. That was before my doctorate. Go watch the debate. You only need to watch the first 50 minutes. All the damage was done in the first 50 minutes. So I'm going to share you tonight what I shared on that. Now let's remind yourself what is it we're saying. Claims about the Quran. Muslims claim it is eternal. Muslims claim it was sent down. Muslims claim it was complete at the time of Uthman. And Muslims claim it is unchanged. All you need is ask those four questions to any Muslim at any time. Just need to remember those four words. Eternal, sent down, complete, unchanged. Well, that's five words. Okay, so I don't know my math. But if you could just remember those four demands. Eternal, sent down, complete, unchanged. My question is, prove it. Prove those four. Which means I know you can't prove eternality, so I'm not going to ask you to prove eternality. Any Muslim sitting here tonight, you can't prove set down because we weren't there. All I'm asking any Muslim here tonight is, show me a complete manuscript of the Quran from the time of Uthman, that's the mid seventh century, which is complete and unchanged. That's all I'm asking, and that's what I asked Dr. Shabir Ali in 2014. And he still has not answered me. He cannot. No matter how good a debater he is, there is no way that any Muslim can answer those three questions. A complete Quran, written in the seventh century, it's unchanged. I'm not asking much. I'm not asking for nine manuscripts, I'm asking for one. Though nine were made, where are those nine manuscripts? Where is the manuscript that was sent to Baghdad, Damas the Magdal, I'm sorry, Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Aden, Hera, and Nishabur. That's all I'm asking. If you could just give me one manuscript from those nine cities that is complete and unchanged, I will be happy. All right? And for those who are watching this on YouTube, this is for all Muslims all over the world. Shabir Ali has not been able to do so. So I'm asking other Muslims to do so. Now, there are many translations. We're not talking about the translations. 106 English translations alone. But what are the claims that Muslims make? So let's look at some of the experts, some of those who, well, not everybody may call them experts. Uh, men like Fethalu Gulen from Turkey, who says there is only one Quran. Men like, or lady, like Suzanne Hanif, who said it is preserved in its original form. Or Jamal al-Din uh, Emzara Bozo, who said it, every Quran is the same throughout the world. The famous translator for the Quran, Abdullah Yusuf Ali from Pakistan, says not a single letter has been changed. That's quite a statement to me. Not a single letter of the Quran has been changed. Zaid ibn Sultan al-Nahim Foundation says not even a dot has been changed. Not even a dot has been changed. Malvi Muhammad Ali from your area, he's one of your men, says not even a diacritical point has been changed. Not even a diacritical point has been changed. Al-Hajj A.B. Ajjola says not, uh, not a jot or tittle. They have put the Quran so high, can you see the claims they're making? That there's not one Muslim that can support any of these claims, and we'll show you why. Now, my good friend, Dr. Shabir Ali, I debated him seven times, six times, excuse me. The last time was in 2014. I doubt he's going to debate me again because of what happened in 2014. Over a, over a half a million people have watched that debate. We know tens of people, Muslims, who have given their life to Jesus Christ because of that one debate. It is a debate that's difficult to watch if you're a Muslim. But Dr. Shabir Ali, even at that debate, I gave these two quotes. When he was debating Tony Costa a number of years ago, he pointed out that we have, we Muslims, have the copy of the Quran dating for 790, that's 790 AD, in the British Museum. That's called the Mutil Codex, which is known as the MS2165 Codex. Folks, that's 1,300 years ago, shall we say. And we can compare that with what we're reading today, and we find them to be exactly identical. 
So before the debate, somebody used to say this. The Quran, the 2165 manuscript, is exactly the same as the Quran we have today. He goes on, the text of the Quran, because the text was known through memory work and through the written materials handed down right from the time of the Prophet Muhammad. As I said, uh, Ali uh, Shabir goes on, the two copies that were made 1400 years ago, one which is in Tashkent, so he's talking about the Samarkan manuscript, which is in Tashkent, and he's talking about the Michael Quran, which is in London at the British Library. These are early copies from that time, and we find no difference from that copy to what we're reading today. So even the best debater in the Muslim world is willing to say that the Ma'il and the Samakad are exactly the same as the Quran we have today. So let's look at these manuscripts. Now, for many years, for 35 years that I've been working in Islam, I could not look at these manuscripts. We did not have access to these manuscripts. Muslims do not give us access to their manuscripts. We give them access to all our biblical manuscripts. There is no restriction on the biblical manuscripts, and most of them are up online. You can go look at the Sinaiticus in its entirety, the uh, Alexandrinus in its entirety. You can look at the Vaticanus in its entirety. You can go look at all, every one of the fragments that are in the Chester Beatty uh, Museum. You can look at the Bodrum Papyrus. You can look at the John Ryland's manuscript. All of these manuscripts and fragments are all available for public scrutiny. We do not hide a thing. There is no reason to hide it. We have been completely transparent. That's why Muslims are able to confront us on it, because we give them everything to confront with. Why have Muslims not allowed us to look at these manuscripts? Until 2002. In 2002, two scholars, now before we get into this, let's just look and see, remind ourselves what the claim is. According to Sahih Bukhari, volume 6, 509, Uthman collected the Quran, uh, sorry, uh, Abu Bakr first collected the Quran and then Uthman correct, collected a second recension in 652. Took all the manuscripts that were that disagreed with it, burned them, and then sent the copy to nine different cities. Just to remind yourself, let's look at a map. Look at the nine provinces. Look where they are. Basra, Baghdad, where you can see them all here. Ba I don't know if this is where Sorry, I'm going to push the wrong button again. Here's Basra, there's Baghdad, there's Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Aden down here. Um, and you have Herat there and Nishapur up there. Okay, so those are all the nine different provinces right there, all in that brown area. Oh, I just pushed the wrong button again. All in this brown area here. That's the time that we're looking at. All right? That's the time that the time of um, Uthman, those within the province that would be under his jurisdiction. According to the According to Arthur Jeffrey, Arthur Jeffrey has been a scholar from the last century in the 1930s. He went to all the Islamic traditions. So he went to the Siratul Rasulullah, he went to the Hadith, he went to the Tafsir, he went to the Tahrid, he went to the four genre of what we know as the Islamic traditions. And he looked at their claims of what they said concerning the original Quran. And what he found out is there were a multiplicity of Qurans, but there were four metropolitan codices that were specifically um, attributed, one is attributed to Ubay ibn Qa'ab and from Damascus. What was interesting, there were 115 chapters in his Quran, yet there's only 114 in the Quran today. There was another Quran that was attributed to Ibn Masud in Kufa. He had 111 chapters. He was missing three chapters in his Quran according to the traditions. Another one by Ibn Musa in Basra had 116 chapters. And then Zayd ibn Thabit was the one that had his in Medina, his was 114. Now this is known back since the 1930s. We've known about this for almost 100 years. This is not new material that I'm teaching teach you right now. And Muslims also know about this. But we really wanted to look at the top copy in the Samarkand, because these are the ones that Shabit Ali specifically looked at. But we can go one step better, because we now have had access to the six major manuscripts, the six major Muslims that Muslims claim were all from the time of Uthman. Here are three of them. The Tokkabi, which is in Istanbul, there in Turkey. The Samarkand, which is in Tashkent, in Uzbekistan. The Ma'il, which is in the Bibliotech, uh, which is the British Museum, uh, British Library, excuse me, in London. The 2165. The Husseini Manuscript, which is in Cairo, in Egypt. The Petropolitanist Manuscript, also known as the BNF, Bibliothèque Nationale, De France, so it's in the Bibliothèque Nationale in uh, Paris. And then most important, probably the most exciting one, is the Sana manuscript, which is just discovered in 1975, which is in Sana in Yemen. So those are the six manuscripts, the Tokkafi, the Samarkand, the Ma'il, the Husseini, the Petropolitanist, and the Sana manuscripts. 
Now, we have only had access to the Petropolitanists and also the Mayel because they are in London and in Paris. The other four we had not access. No one could get access to. No non-Muslim could get access to. And then in 2002, two gentlemen, two Turkish scholars, Professor Dr. Ekmeladin Insanlu and Dr. Tayyip Atukulic, were given access to all six of these manuscripts. They were given it for five years, so from 2002 to 2007, they were able to look at all five of these manuscripts. They were the first ones to do so. They are considered to be the leading scholars in the Muslim world on Arabic script, on Arabic codices or codexes. This is a codex, a book. Especially Dr. Tal al -Tukulic. They are the ones that had access, have always had access, to the top copy, the most important, considered to be the most important by scholars today. What did they find? They came up with their finds in 2009. They finally was written in, uh, translated into English in 2013. That's why I was uh, given access to their material, and that's why I challenged Shabit Ali to a debate. Because now we finally have access to these six manuscripts. These are the earliest manuscripts. These are supposedly complete manuscripts. But these are musas. These aren't just fragments. These are musas. What do they say? First and foremost, I've been in the summary. said, we have no Uthmanic musas. None of them are in Uthmanic. Nor do we have any copies from those musas. These musas date from the later Umayyad period. That's from 661 up until 749. The late Durkim Umayyad period. That means the 8th century, not the 7th century. Dr. Tal Abdukulic, leading scholar of Quranic studies, ex-president of the Turkish Religious Affairs, deputy in the Turkish Parliament, said there has been no serious scholarly work done on any of these manuscripts. These musafs date from the early to mid-8th century. Let me repeat that. Early to mid-8th century. None of them are from the 7th century. They are not Uthmanic, nor even copies sent by him. Let's take a look at each one, one by one. The top copy of the manuscript from early to mid 8th century. There are different pictures of it. We now have access to this. In fact, I have it in our life. We have it in our library now. You can now get the Musaf al Shari. It costs 400 pounds. It's very expensive, but you get the entire manuscript now. We now have access to every page of it. The introduction is in English. You only need to read it. It's only 83 pages long. If any of you do want to get it, you can get it. It's on my computer right over there. I can give it to you even tonight. Al-Tukulic dates the Tokapi manuscript to the second half of the first century AH, that's after Hijrah. So therefore, it is the early to mid-8th century, all right? Not the 7th century. It was neither the private Musaf of Caleb Uthman nor one of the Musafs he sent to various centers. There are deviations from grammatical rules and spelling mistakes in the Musafs attributed to Caleb Uthman. He concludes that there are 2,270 instances where there's a difference from the constant skeleton of the Fat text. That's the canonical text that we use today. It has 2,270 differences. And yet it comes from the mid 8th century. That's about 100 years after Muhammad. Therefore, you cannot use it at all. It is not the Uthmanic text, and it comes from 75 to 100 years after Uthman, and yet it has 2,270 manuscript variants. There are difference after difference with the 1924 text, which is the canonical text we're using today, like in Surah 14, Ayah 38, completely different when you look at the context. Surah 3, Ayah 158. I'm not going to go through all 2,270 because we'd be here all night. What about the Samarkand manuscript? This is the one that's probably the more famous. It's the one that was brought to London a few years ago to represent the greatest of all manuscripts for the Quran. It was brought to the British Library and I went to see it. And you can see it's a very large text. It's what we call a monumental text. It has been dated by both of the Kulich and Salalu to the early to mid 8th century again. Now, what's fascinating, Alta Kulit says it is not with money as it dates from the mid 8th century, and the six reasons that he says are problems with it. It has undisciplined spelling, it has different writing styles, it has scribal mistakes, it has copyist mistakes, it was written by someone with little experience with later editions, and it only goes up to Surah 43. There's 114 surahs in the Quran. It wasn't even complete. Now, even when you look at those 43 surahs, of what they existed in. Take a look at them and you will see there is only one complete surah amongst the 43. 24 of them are partial 
18 have nothing in them. They're completely blank. So why haven't Muslims told us this? They have this, but they have this manuscript for 1,300 years. Why in 1,300 years did we have to wait till 2013 finally to find out how little, how hopeless a Quran it is? In fact, al Qulit says it's an embarrassment because of its terrible grammar that it uses. The differences between the short copy and the summer card, you can see over and over again. These are just examples. If you want to study these more, those of you who want the PowerPoint, take a look and just see how different they are just between the two copies. So they don't even agree with each other. These are two manuscripts from the 8th century that don't even agree with each other, and neither of them are complete. The Mount Quran that we have in London, we have known about. This 2165 Quran, it also only goes up to Surah 43. 53% of the Quran is missing. It is dated to the late 8th century or early 8th century. Now that one is full of manuscript variants. We've already known about that. The al Husayni Cairo, in Cairo, sorry, manuscript, is early to mid 8th century. Dated by al Qulut, it says, he says this is not Uthmanic. It is dated from the early to mid 8th century. This copy is not one of the Muslims attributed to the Caliph Uthman. In fact, Francois de Roche, who is the European scholar, uh, considered to be the world's authority on the earliest manuscripts, he dates this manuscript to the 9th century, not to the 8th century, because of, of the fact that it used a monumental uh, it used a monumental form. That was borrowed from the Christian manuscripts in the late 8th century to the early 9th century. Note, if you look carefully, the coverings on the text. Can you see the coverings there? There's a covering there, there's a covering there. There's a covering. We're going to talk about that. Over and over again, you see these coverings on this text. There's a covering there. They're, they're covering words. They're covering up things. They don't want you to read part of the text. Then we get to the Paris Petropolitanus, which is also known as the Bibliothèque National de France, from the Bibliothèque National. This is the early 8th century. This is the one that is, had, has been uh, worked over by François de Roche, Dr. François de Roche. He has authority over this manuscript. He has already said very clearly that there are corrections to the text. It disagrees with the Kyrene Musa in 93 places. That means the Kyrene Musa means the Musa that we use today, the 1924. In five different copies who wrote it, had later modifications with erasers and additions. The largest section of this Petropolis manuscript is only 20, only concludes 26% of the Quran. Most of the Quran is missing. And yet Muslims have said it's complete. And that there's no difference between this manuscript and the Quran we have today. Why haven't they told us the truth? When you look at the Petropolis with the 1924, you will see place and area, verse after verse, we don't have time to go through all of it. And then we get to the Song Manuscript. And this is probably one of the most exciting ones because it's the most recent that was discovered. It is also the earliest dated of all the manuscripts. It is dated to the early 8th century. Because of the fact it didn't have any diacritical marks, nor did it have any vowelization, German scholars were flown down in 1981 to look at it. They were given access, they took pictures of it, those pictures of them were confiscated by the Yemeni government. They were only released to them in 1997. I got to know Gerd Quinn, Dr. Gerd Quinn, and I went to see him in Germany, and he let me take a picture of some of his, those folios. But what was interesting, when you look at it, you will see that parts of it also have these tapings, the palette tapings. Now, you might say, well, maybe there's some, something's damaged there. But when you look at the backside, you will find there's no damage whatsoever. These are intentional tapings. You know, can't probably see all this, but these are all the different folios within the Sana manuscripts. And you can see only 22% of the Quran is in that folio. Only, uh, this one only has about 25% of the Quran. None of these are complete. This one only goes up one to 29 folios. Here 11 surahs are, are, are changeovers. You can see an enormous amount of manipulation of the text. Over a thousand manuscript variants were counted by Gary Quinn when I visited him. And when, you let me, when he let me take a picture of it, he said, take a look here, here's Surah 19, and then it jumps to Surah 22 at that yellow mark. What happened to Surah 20 and 21? Well, suddenly Surah 20 appears on the opposite side of the page. But if you look carefully, you will see these are two completely different scripts. That is 705, this is the late 8th century. There's about 60 to 70 years between those two pages. Every time you see these orange marks, every one of those orange marks are what we call manuscript variants. That means words or phrases in this text that are not the same as the Quran we have in our hand today. And he said there were about roughly around 1,000 at that time. Now, the differences in, the, are, in meaning are theological in some cases. 
But what's fascinating is that it has an undertext. See, when you use parchment or vellum, animal skins, many times in the old days, they would write and then they would wash it off and write over top. And that's called a palimpsest. That was quite common, especially if it was a manuscript that was not that important. It was a school text or things like that. In this case, you could tell it was a there was a lower text, you can see it visually, because it's bled through over the years. And what they did is they put it under ultraviolet and light, and they were able to separate the text. Now, just a month ago, Asma Hilani has finally come out with the under text. Here's the book. It's only a week old. I've only had it for one week. She has finally now exposed what is in this text. There are hundreds of differences between the lower text and the upper text. They are not the same text. You can see that there are so many differences. Now, what she has said, the lower text is probably 50 years older than the upper text. The upper text would be 705, which would put this around to the time of Uthman. It would be about the time of Uthman, the lower text. The problem is it disagrees with the upper text. It's not the same text. It jumps all over the place. Much is missing. That's just come out in the last month. Now what, what she says, and she didn't know what to do, so she calls it, she says, the lower text is nothing more than a student's notes. A student's notes. Isn't it interesting? This may pro prove to be the oldest Quran in existence. And yet it's nothing more than student's notes. So where is the original from which the notes were taken? Why is it only the notes have lasted for 1,400 years and no original has been retained for 1400 years. Could there be a reason for that? Is it that this is not a student's notes, but this is a nascent Quran? The undertext is a nascent Quran from which other Qurans have been changed and manipulated later on. Because when you look at the two texts, you can see over and over again, they did this in Australia. I get this from Dr. Fernie Powers. This is his material showing how in Surah 9, Ayah 73, how the lower and the upper texts change with each other. Here you have Surah 9, Ayah 76, where every time you see pink is the lower text, when you see the yellow and the, the green, it, it disagrees with the upper text. Here you can see Surah 9, Ayah 80, so we'll continue in Surah 9. The lower text is missing almost the entire verse, though it's there in the upper text. When was that added? Why was it added? Why wasn't it there in the earlier text? The lower text. When you look at the Sana manuscript, the upper text with the 1924, you can see over and over again, it, even the upper text doesn't agree with the Sana, the 1924 that we have today. There you can see it in Surah 2, Ayah 2201. There how the differences are. There you can see in Surah 63, Ayah 7. Because of time, I'm not going to look at the significance of what this, how this changes the theology of the, of the, of the, of the verse. Significance of what we have found? None of the six earliest manuscripts are from the seventh century. None of them are complete. None of them agree completely with each other, and none of these six manuscripts agree completely with the 1924 canonical Huff's text that we have in our hand today. Thus, this again proves there has been intentional human interventions even within the first century. Now let's go then to corrections. And this may be more the most devastating material. This is material that's come out of a doctoral thesis done by Dr. Dan, uh, Dr. Dan Brubaker. Dr. Dan Brubaker uh, did this as his thesis. He, he let me have access to his doctoral thesis in 2014. And I introduced this at the debate in 2014. The claims are the Quran is eternal, sent down from heaven, untouched by human hands, thus no corrections, no corruptions. So that the Quran we have now is exactly like that in heaven, sent to Muhammad and compiled by Uthman with no interference by man. Are you hearing this? Are you getting this? This is the same repeated claim right here from every Muslim everywhere I go. Let's see if that's so. What Dr. Dan Brubaker has found is that there were insertions, erasures, erasures overwritten, overwriting, taping, selective covering, selective covering, overwritten. He therefore went to these six manuscripts, was given access by me to these six manuscripts, being a doctoral research student, and he filmed them. He took pictures of every page of the manuscripts. Then he went to four other manuscripts that are old, that are much more recent, not the older ones, but more recent, like St. Petersburg manuscript in St. Petersburg in Russia. And this is what he found. Looking at the six major manuscripts, he found 390 insertions. These are words that are inserted. See where it's inserted on the line? You see where it's inserted here? Here where it's inserted. 
And you see where the word's inserted here. These are insertions, 390 post-production additions to the text. These were done after the text was already finished. You can see where the search in the top copy in Surah 66, Ayah 8. Repent until you give by, by it sincerely, then changes to turn unto Allah in sincere repentance. That's quite a difference. Because one says to repent, the other says to go to Allah to repent. Allah's name is added later on. Can you see why this is hugely significant theologically? And this is from the top copy, the greatest of all manuscripts. Here's an insertion that he found on Surah 3, Ayah 47. You can see it's completely above the line. Here's an insertion on the Pretoponus text that's been squeezed in between two letters there. Obviously, it's been put in at a later time. It doesn't, there's not even space to accommodate it on Surah 2, Ayah 137. Here's an insertion on the Petropolis manuscript, BNF, Arabia 327, on Surah 23, Ayah 86. And you can see it's completely above the line. That whole word up there, uh, which is al Saba, has then been added to that in Surah 23. Here you have Surah 49 in the Sana manuscript, where you have, they believe, changed to the believers. Then he found 390 erasers, intentional removing of the text from the pages. There you can see where they erased it. We have no idea what we used to be there. Love, we'd love to know if we could find out why they erased it, but obviously they're trying to change the text, trying to change the manuscript. Top copy Musa, verses the 1924, at verse 73, chapter 73, verse 20, a single word was erased between the words two-third and the night. Unfortunately, we will never know what the word was, which was erased in the top copy manuscript. Here they have the al Husayni Cairo manuscript in, in uh, Egypt, where in Surah 49, 6, something is erased from after the word Fasaka. While for this verse, the word Fasaka is used in this manuscript, the word Fasaku is used instead in the 1924 Puffs text. So not only is the a word that has been erased, it doesn't even agree with the 1924 text once they have changed it. Here's an erasure of the Petropolis manuscript that's in Paris in Surah 56, I 11. And here's another example of the Sada manuscript in Surah 7, I 158. I, I'm going very quick through these because you can see, if I go become too tedious, I'll put you all to sleep. But this is for you to go back and look at your own time. I can see a few people are nodding, so we'll go a little quicker. <laughs> <laughs> and here's St. Peter's or Kijazi manuscript from Surah 26, I 70. Then he found 560 erasers overwritten. So what they did is they overwrote the entire sentence here. A change was made at some time after the page was originally produced. Here they erased and they've overwritten, but they didn't erase very well, so you can see what word they changed. There you can see where they erased and they've written another word over top. Here they put it in a completely different color already. Erases that are overwritten on the BNF text in Surah 11. Here you have an eraser that's overwritten in the, the uh, Surah 3, Ayah 171, in the Petropolis text. Here's one from the St. Peter's manuscript in Surah 7, Ayah 181. And then 190, 190 overwriting without erasers. Here you can see where they didn't even bother to erase, they just wore over top. Which means you can look at both the longer and the over text, and you can see exactly what they're changing. Overriding without erasures in the top copy most of them. In Surah 70, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry about that, but that's my computer, or this part of the computer. Over, over the end. <laughs> Overriding without erasures in the Sana manuscript, Sadiq manuscript in Surah 3, Ayah 104. Then you have selective coverings. 550 of these coverings that I mentioned earlier. There's a covering, there's a covering, there's a covering, there's a covering. Look here, it's, you almost can't even read the page, there's so many coverings. Look at all the different coverings. Why aren't they covering these scripts? What are they trying to hide? Here's the coverings in the Husseini Cairo. Here's another covering in the Husseini Cairo. Look at that, in fact, most of the page has covering after covering. Another covering, you can see a whole multiplicity of coverings. One, two, three, four, five, six coverings in the Husseini manuscript. Then they have selective covers were written where they covered it and then they overwrote over top. So there they covered it and they written something over top, just one letter at a top. Here you can see where they've written two words. Here's a covering with a word that you can see over and over again they've covered it. And then they came to these patches. He found these patches, which he thought maybe because the manuscript was worn or had been destroyed. But he looked at the back, there was no damage whatsoever. And there you can see, there's a patch, there's a patch. There's a patch. Look at all these patches. I'm doing my left hand, so I'm not that accurate. So what can we conclude? 
he found over 2,200 corrections. Now that was in 2014. Today, I was just on the phone with him, it's now over 3,500 that he has found. He's still finding hundreds upon hundreds of corrections. So we found out over a thousand more. I don't know how many more we're gonna find before he finally gives up. Now, what are these corrections? These are not diacritical marks. This is not vowelization. This has nothing to do with the daga of. These are consonantal differences. This is the rosum, the letters that are being changed. They continue up until the ninth century. That means for 200 years, they were still changing it. So how can Muslims say that the Quran was complete in the seventh century? When you have hundreds upon hundreds of corrections that continue up until the ninth century. But see, we didn't know about this two years ago. We've now only found it out in just the last two years. So what can we conclude? Well, Western scholars like Deroche, Aurin, Conrad, Peters, Stein, Shoemaker, all conclude that the earliest Muslims begin to appear in the eighth century. Western scholars have now come to that conclusion. Muslim scholars like Ekmeladin and Tarot de Kulich conclude that the earliest Muslims begin to appear in the eighth century. Islamic Awareness, part of the largest website that deals with manuscript evidence, has been a pain in our site for years, has now finally concluded that there are no complete Uthmanic Muslims and that all the early Muslims date from the late 7th to early 8th century or later. The latest research shows that even those Muslims have seven forms of corrections dating up to the 9th century. Therefore, I conclude, since Muslims cannot prove that there are any complete manuscripts in the title of Uthman, the Quran is not eternal, it was not sent down, it is not completed by the 8th century, it is not the same, it has been changed. So, my question, and I said this to Shabir Ali at the debate, if this did not come from Muhammad, if it did not come from Muhammad, if the Quran was only began to be written down and starts to appear in the 8th century, who is Muhammad and what is his purpose? Now, he got very angry when I said that, and you can see why. Muhammad, we're going to confront on Saturday. I'm going to leave Muhammad for tonight, come Saturday, because we're going to confront him historically. We're confronting the Quran tonight. We work with Muhammad on Saturday. Significance, all of these manuscripts have changes to them. These changes are, are Muslim changes. That means they're consonantal changes, not simple diacritical marks of vowelizations. They continue to be changed for hundreds of years. There was an intentional standardization of the text. Thus, this again proves there has been intentional human intervention. Number five, modern late corrections. This is the new material now. Are there differences in the modern Arabic Qurans? These are Qurans that you can buy today around the Arab-speaking world, okay? We're not talking about ancient Qurans anymore. Now we're looking at modern Qurans. Now, what, what do I mean by Razm? When I talk about Razm, in the Arabic language, there are 28 letters. Yet amongst them, when you look at the 28 letters, seven are unique letters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, the alif, ya, wa, ha, nu, sorry, mim, la, in, ka. Those are the unique letters. That means they always remain the same. You cannot change them with dots above or below the line. Two of them, these two, sorry, three of them, uh, you can, depending on when you still, you can put uh, that little smiley face, you put one dot below it, it's a tha. The other smiley face with two dots above it, it's a tha. If you have three dots above it, it's going to tha. If you have one dot above it, it becomes a na. If you have two dots below it, it becomes a ya, na, ta, ta, ba, ya. It can be five different letters, depending on where you put the dots. Are you seeing why? It's important that you have dots. The dots didn't exist in archaic manuscripts. There are no dots in any of these manuscripts we've looked at today. Have you noticed that? Dots were only created in the 8th century, in the 9th century, because you could not read the context of the Arabic. How do I know that? Well, take a look. Let's just look at this, these here. Now, let's look at three smiley faces next to each other. <laughs> when you put dots on them, using these three smiley faces, you get 19 different words, depending on the dots. Now, actually, I'm wrong. My Arab teacher tells me you can get 22 different words. She's found 22. I'm not Arabic, so I give her the benefit of the doubt. Can you see why dots are needed for in order for you to read the text? So, Hatun, a friend of mine, one of our colleagues on our team, has decided to go around the world. Hatun Tush is an Arab, is a, um, she is a Turkish, used to be a Muslim, her father was an Imam, she converted to Christianity, and she decided to ask this question about the Arabic text. And she went around the Muslim world in the last two years, 
She wanted to find out how many different Arabic Qurans she could find. She found 26 different Arabic Qurans. Now that's out of date, because as of two months ago, she's up to 31 different Arabic Qurans. What am I talking about? Well, here you have al -Bazi. I'm just going to go through them really quickly. Here are all the 31 that she has now found. These are, every one of them is different. Not one of them is the same. These are not translations. These are all in Arabic. You can buy them in the Arab world today. These are all bound, uh, bought in different Arab marketplaces in Yemen, in Jordan, and in Morocco. This is where she went. Now, what she noticed is that every one of these manuscripts is attributed to students who lived in the ninth century. And these are their names from five different cities in, I just want to make sure I got them right. Mecca, Medina, Damascus, Kufa, and Basra. These are the five major cities. These all came from scholars who then taught students, but every student made their own text. Here you have Al-Bazi. He has over 1,094 differences between his manuscript and the Quran we have today. Over here you have Wash, which is a very famous one, popular one, that's in North Africa. It has a 312, but the Kalun one has 1,700. You come down here to some of these like Kalat has 2,400 differences. Here you have Abu al al -Hara. He has 5,000 differences between his Quran and the Quran we have today. But which is the Quran that we have today? Which one of these 31 is this Quran? You want to see? It's this one. The Hus Quran. There he is. His name is Hus. He died in 805, the early 9th century. This Quran is only one of 31 Qurans decided and chosen by a group of scholars in Al Azhar University in Cairo in 1924, 93 years ago. But here's the question How do we know that this is even Hafs? Because we don't have Hafs manuscript. There is no Hafs manuscript. So, what manuscript? is this Quran from? Don't use the top copy. That has 2,270 differences. You better not use the Samarkand. That only goes up to Surah 43. You can't use the Petropolitanus. That only has 26% of the Quran. You better not use the Sana. That has thousands of manuscripts. Not one of those earliest manuscripts supports this book here. Are you following me? So the Muslims are saying this all comes from us in 805. That's a thousand years ago, not 1400 years, but we don't even have us. Here are some of the differences. Now we went up and we took this down to Speaker's Corner a year ago, and we caused a riot at Speaker's Corner. If you go up on Fander Field, you'll see what happened. The Muslims went berserk. Last July, we went and did it again. We put up the 31, it sounds like 26 of them, and we almost didn't make it from the corner. They wanted, they grabbed it, they tried to take it out of our hands. You can go look at the video. It was, we almost didn't get away ourselves physically. They were so angered. This angers Muslims because they have been told today that every Quran is exactly the same. In every country, every Quran the same. And we showed 26 different Qurans, all in Arabic, that you can buy in the market today. And you can see, we went and put it up on our film. You can go look at it. Then we put just 70 slides of the differences, one after the other, just like you're seeing here. I'm not going to go through them today because this would take all night and you would be all fast asleep. <laughs> There's a myriad of changes. We can find over 5,000 vowel identification changes, average of 100 to 150 consonant differences. But what was interesting, just Hatu Tash on her own with her Arab teacher was able to find 56,000 differences between these 31 different Qurans. 56,000 differences, and that's as far as she's gone right now. Talk to me in a year, it'll probably be double that number. Why have Muslims not told us this before? Now, Muslims will say this is nothing more than Akhruf or Kiryat. We're looking at all of them, and we're finding that this is way beyond. But then they made the claim about three weeks ago that the, that the Hafs that we have today is exactly the same all over the world, that every one of this, that this book you can find here, is exactly the same all over the world. That was until last week. Hatu came up with seven different Hafs Qurans. There are seven different Hafs Qurans. You're looking at the seven right there. They don't even agree with each other. 
So where are Muslims getting off saying that all the Qurans are the same? If we can find, she just looked at Surah 27 and looked at the first five verses of Surah 27 and just compared it three of the Hafs with each other and she came up with 27 differences. And she did that within a period of 30 minutes. Folks, this is a lie that we're hearing from Islam. There is not one Quran. There are a multiplicity of Qurans. Even today, the Qurans in the marketplaces do not, uh, do not match. So why in the world do Muslims keep saying this? We find 31 different Arabic Qurans, all of them date back to the 9th century, yet only one of those 31 was chosen as the official canonical text in 1924, the Hafs text. Yet we have seven different Hafs texts appearing today, thus this again proves there has been intentional human intervention. So now let's end with the Birmingham folios. Considered to be the greatest manuscripts, it is only two pages. That's all it is, two pages. It's not even a manuscript. When you look at it, you will see, there it is. Dr. David Thomas, who is a curator for this manuscript, said, the writer of this manuscript could, could well have known the Prophet Muhammad. He would have seen him probably. He would maybe have heard him preach. He may have known him personally. And that really is quite a thought to conjure, conjure with. This is all that we're talking about. Two folios, front and back, either side, of Surah 18, Surah 19, and Surah 20. Parts of Surah 18, sorry, Surah 19, and Surah 20. But look at the dates. It was dated by carbon dating at Oxford University, at the carbon dating labs in Oxford. And they dated it between 568 and 6048, 5 AD, which would does correspond with Muhammad's life. He was born in 570 and died in 632. The problem is, can you see a problem immediately? And this is why Muslim scholars have not come and supported this. If it, even the latest of this carbon dating were correct, that's seven years before it was money even put together in the Quran. So you cannot have it that early. More than that, take a look at what it includes. It includes the seven sleepers of Ephesus in Surah 18, Ayah 17 to 31. It includes the Proto-Evangelium of James, the Pseudo-Gospel of Matthew, uh, written in 145 AD and 680. It also includes the story of Moses in Surah 2 at 20, Ayah 1 to 40. Every one of these stories in these two folios are from earlier material. It's all borrowed material, apocryphal accounts. If you're gonna borrow them, they're earlier, aren't they? Anything that's borrowed has to be earlier. Now, what's interesting, these are not the only, these are not the only um, labs that have been dating manuscripts. The Sala manuscript has now been dated at the Lyon lab in, in France, and the dates they're getting, the carbon datings they're getting for those Quranic manuscripts are 388 to 538, 5 AD. Muhammad was born in 570. These predate not only Muhammad, they predate the Quran and they predate Islam. 443 to 599 AD. Are you going to go with those dates, Muslims? Because if you're going to go with the dates for the Birmingham folio, you have to go with the Leon dates. You have to go with the Kiel dates. You have to go with the Arizona labs. There are many labs that are now doing carbon dating on these manuscripts, and they take you right back to the fourth to the fifth century AD. Fifth century AD. Muhammad was born in the sixth century AD. These all predate Muhammad. They all predate the Quran. Be careful about jumping onto this story because this is going to destroy you if you use it. Either way, it's a win-win for us because if it is true that those carbon dates are correct, then I would suggest that these are nothing more than examples of apocryphal accounts, of which, if you remember, 25% of the Quran is. More than likely, however, we're going to find that these carbon dates are not correct. These are all pre-Quranic. So the conclusion of the Birmingham folios the ink has not been dated because you cannot date ink because ink is a melange of many different inks from many different periods. They show that the classical account is wrong and suggest the stories in the Quran were borrowed from outside, usually simple stories. These folios could be examples of those earlier sources written in Arabic, thus they're pre-Islamic, pre-Muhammad, and pre-Quranic. The fact that they were borrowed suggests they came from man-made stories, proving that they're once again their intentional human interaction. The seven areas we've investigated tonight, we're going to now end this all up. Number one, look at the comp compilation difficulties. When you look at the compilation difficulties, you will find that how it was put together was by man. The historical inaccuracy, only man makes mistakes like that. God does not make historical mistakes. Source criticism, 25% of the crown comes from Jewish sources and Christian, not even Christian sources, 
from Gnostic sources, sectarian sources, heretical sources, manuscript criticism. It's obviously the earliest six manuscripts that we have. None of them agree, none of them are from the seventh century, and they don't agree with the problem we have today. Again, human manipulation. The ancient corrections, you can see from Dan Brubaker's material, hundreds upon hundreds of corrections that continue up until the ninth and tenth century. The modern corrections, 31 different Qurans, even the Hafs, the final one that was created, where did it come from? Where is its origin? Why is it that we've come up with even seven of these Hafs Quran in just the last week? And then the Birmingham police, don't go there. If you're gonna start using carbon dating, be careful, it will bite you. Because the carbon datings put the Quran back to the fourth century and the fifth century, and you don't wanna do that because that's long before Muhammad even existed. So, what are the questions still standing? Why do we have not have a complete seventh century Quran? I'm still asking Muslims, where is that original manuscript? Just one, not nine, just one. Where are the nine copies of the Quran which were sent out to the nine provinces? Why do all the Quranic manuscripts only appear after the eighth to the ninth century? Why are there still 31 different Arabic Qurans in existence today? And doesn't this prove that the Quran did not come from God, nor Muhammad, nor Uthman, but by simple men? To summate what we've just done, revision set the stage, we move on. The questions they ask, we expand, we must confront Islam's foundations, we must challenge the Quran. We do this, the same has been done to the Bible, both we must bring into the public sphere. Why? Because similar historical questions have already been asked of the Bible and answered. Conclusion is, the Quran is not eternal, it was not sent out, was not complete by 650, it has been changed. It's nothing more than a book written and changed by man, but hold on a minute, hold on a minute. What about the Word of God? Who became flesh and dwelt among us? His name is Jesus Christ. See, we also have a Word of God. Yes, the Bible is the Word of God, but this is not the only Word of God that we have. We have another Word of God, much greater than this one, of what this Bible points to, who is the Word of God. His name is Jesus Christ and he came to earth. Now let's ask these four questions of that Word of God. Is Jesus eternal? Any answer? Yes. Was Jesus set down? Yes, he was. Is Jesus complete? Yes, he is. Is Jesus unchanged? Absolutely. The four things the Muslims need, we've already got. Muslims, come on home. We have what you're looking for, and his name is Jesus Christ. That's why, folks, when you want to ask these questions, if you're gonna claim, claim the main claims you make about this book, be able to source what you claim. Make sure you can support what you claim. You can no longer make suppositions like Shabin Ali has been doing for years and years. You can no longer say this book is eternal. Don't even say that, don't even go there. You can no longer say that books was sent down to Mad Muhammad. We don't even know who Muhammad is. Wait till Saturday, you'll see why I say that. Don't say that this book was complete. It was not complete. And never say it's not been changed. It has change after change after change, all the way up until 1924, which means it is only 93 years old. Prince Philip in England is older than your Quran. I said this at the debate in 2014, and I repeat it again. Prince Philip is older than your Quran. Now, Jesus, however, is much older than Prince Philip. And I thank God that I can come back to Jesus Christ as the Word of God. I don't, we don't have these problems with the Bible. Yes, we admit that there are many manuscripts. We know that there are manuscript variants, and that's why we know exactly where they are, and we let the whole world know we're as transparent as you get. Because we know the Bible was written by men, inspired by God, written by men about one man, and his name is Jesus Christ. And I offer him to you tonight. What a God, what a man, what a word of God. Eternal, sent down, complete, and unchanged. We've gone way over time, sorry about that, but are there any questions you may have? Especially for the Muslims who are here. Are there, Muslims, let me ask you, are there any questions that you can throw at me from what you heard tonight? There's way too many. There's way too many, okay, go ahead and get started. No, I mean, I, I can't even begin. There, there's just so much that I, I honestly have lost count of the flaws that were in your arguments at various points. Uh, Try to just one. Everything until the part where you um, 
uh, went through the manuscript. Yeah. Um, that was mostly incorrect history or incorrect in interpretation of history or um, other things after that I can't comment because I don't know and most of your pieces of authority are either the Bible or your friends like Tatoon. So I don't know if I can count on their pieces or whatever. Well, let's stick with the manuscripts since you, since you did bring this up. What is your problem with the manuscript evidence that we did? No, I, I have no comment on that because I really don't know about it. Does this. is it persuasive? Uh, if it's all true, uh, maybe. This is all going on to the internet, so anybody is able to confront me on it. These manuscripts are now open for the world to see. This is the first time that I can say that in 35 years, that all of these manuscripts now are transparent. What are you as a Muslim going to do when you realize that these manuscripts don't agree? Well, uh, I wouldn't take your word for it. I'll acquire the manuscripts myself. Go ahead. Please I do. And I encourage you to do that. And that's when I can make a value judgment here. I mean, but that, that your word is not enough because it's not con convincing enough because you mostly have this PUC or authority that's which, which not in I don't know Shabir Ali, to be honest. I know a lot of What's other uh, policy. Pazi, this is Pazi. It's great that you're making these uh, these claims. I would suggest now that you have seen or heard what you've heard tonight, go to get this PowerPoint, go and look it up, find out and look at these variants, and then ask your imam or anybody in authority. I'm not expecting you to be a man of authority because you would want to go to those who are in authority. Go and ask them what they're doing with these variants. Ask Shabir Ali, considered to be the world's leading authority. In, for debating on the manuscripts, ask him what he's doing. Do you know what he's doing? I don't he know says, I don't have to worry about them. I only care about the 1924 manuscript. Okay. What an admission. Admitting that the only manuscript that he will look at to find his miracle of the number 19, he still talks about the miracle of the 19. He will only go to the 1924 manuscript. He doesn't want to be bothered by the earlier manuscripts. To me, that's a huge admission. And I hope that Muslims we are aware that no longer can publicly they say that the Quran has never been changed. No longer can they say that the Quran is the same today as its origins. No longer can they say that there is only one Quran in the world today. There are a multiplicity of Qurans. Well, uh, my only comment would be that obviously, uh, even if it's, uh, if it's any religion at all, be Christianity, be of Islam, at no point can you say we can prove anything. At, at some point, you have to take something on your face. That's why we call them religion, not science. Well, that's and a cop-out, sir. That's a real cop-out. We can prove whether the Bible is, it has managed to prove. We can the, prove these historical claims. See, every scripture makes historical claims, does it not? Not just the Quran or the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, the, the Upanishads, the Book of Mormon. Anytime it makes a historical claim, we have a responsibility to check out that claim. Yeah, but like uh, one of your, one, I can give one example, like the thing that you talked about carbon date, right? You presented all of these ranges for each one of those universities or institutes, right? And then the earliest part of that, it was always a range, it was not an exact number that this is the year it came out. It was from this year to this year. Right. And as we, as you might also have noticed, that the last range of that thing, every, each one of those institutes was in the time of the prophet or after him. Only the earlier date was something that preceded the prophet. So these are several examples about how things you can't confirm ever. No matter how... All I'm saying is be careful with that, because not only are you going to be stung by it, because then if you're going to accept that carbon dating from the Oxford lab, you're going to have to accept the carbon dating from the Keele lab, from the Leo lab, from the Arizona lab. Interestingly, who are coming with dates that go back to 443 AD. Do you really want to accept that for the Quran? That's what I'm saying. They are going back. That's one part of the range, right? It's from, from this date to this date. 443 to 599. Then you have. Was there any even in any Quran at 599? Then you have very good reason to deny the plausibility of that institute. I'm sorry? Then you have very good reason to deny the plausibility of that very institute. Is it even doing its job right? Is I see. So you only accept what fits your paradigm. You That's only what accept you're doing those though. discoveries. Be careful because you, you see how ridiculous that sounds to us listening to you. That's what you're doing. Please don't go me with the facts. My mind's already made up, is what you're saying. Don't do that in front of all of us. Please don't. Okay? Well, being a That's why I think it's very there. important that Muslims start to accept what the, the, the scientists are finding. It wasn't, it wasn't only one laboratory. It's, Listed about 10. There are five laboratories that are now looking and doing carbon dating. Now, my personal view, I'll tell you, I don't think the carbon dating is exact. Let me tell you why. Look and see what they've done with the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
there are hundreds of years of difference depending on which part of the density scores you're looking at. That's why if you even look at carbon dating, the whole deterioration of carbon has only been measured in two areas of the world, in California and in Japan. So these manuscripts don't even come from that part of the world. So the carbon depletion is not the same in the Middle East as it is in California and Japan. So I would suggest all of these are inexact. So I would agree with you on that. But please don't say it fits within the prophet's life because this one fits within your prophet's life. You can't just accept one uh, uh, finding and not accept all the other findings. That's all I'm saying. Be careful because you're going to look ridiculous in no, no, my point is that if all of them seem to be fitting in this lifetime and one of them does not fit, then that's a good reason to say that this one might be wrong. Did you notice that none of them fit in the prophet's life? The only the one was that the Roman Folio in Oxford. The ones that you showed on the list, each one of them had their two day that was fitting in the life. Should we go back to it? I'll show you. They were yeah, yeah go, ahead, go ahead. They're from 443. Go ahead. Oh, what did I just do? And then in the meanwhile, while you're getting there, let me tell everybody about how the compilation of the Quran took place. And I'm no expert. I'm only telling you guys what I have learned from the books of history. And um, basically the process of compilation was not that uh, people did not write this down. His secretary was not a secretary. He was a scribe. And his task was to memorize everything the Prophet said, everything. Not just what he said, this is from the Quran, everything. And if he was one of the, uh, I think six or seven of them. And what happened in this lifetime was nobody, nobody used to write at that time. The Quran. No one used to write at that time? Are you the suggesting Quran. that no, the, the libraries Quran. in Alexandria didn't exist? Oh, Are you just, suggesting I'm, that from all the way from there. Spain to India, no one could read or write? I'm going there, I'm going there. They did not write the Quran as a part because they had the Quran in front of them. They could ask about the Quran anytime they wanted from the Prophet himself. The authority was right there. They had no reason to write. They could go, they, he lived next door. You could go walk up to him and ask him, what did you say the other day about what God said? And he would repeat exactly that way. The problem came about writing was in the first caliphate, Abu Bakr. So it was not compiled in the third caliphate by Uthman. It was first compiled by Abu Bakr. He asked that bin Sabi to compile. I said that tonight, did you not hear me? Sorry? Yeah, the yeah, first yeah. recension is Abu Bakr. Why is it that they had to wait to Abu Bakr to write the first recension? Yeah, I'm going to that. There was a battle of Yamama, as you said. Okay. Right? A lot of the, the so at that time, everybody had memorized the Quran. Everybody knew it by heart. What did they to memorize? This day, to this day, what did they memorize? Everything the Prophet said. That was including parts of what he said are in the Quran. What did they memorize the again? What manuscript did they memorize? What codified canonical text did they memorize? They didn't Let me tell you right tonight. If I read everything I said tonight, yeah. If I were to ask every one of you to then write down what I said tonight off the top of your memory, how many different renditions would you have of what I said tonight just from memory? Quite a few, right? Quite a few. Probably. Not only that, what happens when it's said orally? What happens with oral tradition? Now, you've played that uh, birthday party game where you, I sent something to his ear, he sends to her, he talks to her, him, him. By the time it gets over to here, what I've told him and what he tells me are two different things. The problem with oral tradition, it gets manipulated, it gets accreted, it gets deleted. That can happen within a period of 15 minutes. To say everybody memorized it, prove it to me. You can't even prove it, you're just making, basically you're making syllogisms, you're just talking off the top of your head. Because there's no way in the world that we can prove that it was memorized correctly, since there's no manuscript to support what you just said. And when it was finally written down at the time of Abu Bakr, which you do admit, why did it have to be written again 20 years later? What was wrong with the first manuscript? And then why did all the other manuscripts have to be burnt? Obviously there were differences. And then when that manuscript was written down at the time of Uthman, sent to nine different cities, where are they today? Why can't you, why isn't there not one manuscript available for us to look at today? It's not the fact that people could memorize, I'm sure they could. I would suggest that when you memorize anything, you have different memories. We know that even in the 21st century, how difficult, different our memories are. I know that with my wife. We see the same thing. We get home. When we get home and we tell our son, she tells a totally different story than I tell. And it's just happened maybe half an hour ago. Now that is quite typical of human memory. So don't tell me everybody memorized it perfectly. 114 surahs, everybody memorized it perfectly. That's easy to say, but you can have no proof for that, especially when we do know that according to the traditions, it was written down in 632. Why was there a need to write it down? Unless, be, unless of course, there was differences in memory. I can't answer that. Okay. 
<coughs> my name is Tariq Sai. I belong to MDA community and working here as an imam. <coughs> I want to tell you that you belong to Christian community and you have your faith and you want to prove Christian beliefs. If you listen a Muslim scholar, he will prove that Anjir is not good, is, uh, is changeable, is not uh, God's word and uh, they have their education for uh, Christianity. So this is a debate we cannot satisfy one to each other. We should expect our uh, thinking that how you discuss. So if you listen only your own speaker, then you are one side. So we should listen our opponent, how they explain. Today you have this discussion that uh, there is a historical uh, problem with Quran. There is also historical problems with Anjib, with the New Testament. So I am as a Muslim, I came here, I want to listen to you, how you think about my religion. So like this, uh, our Christian brothers, they should also attend the Muslim programs. They make them friends and they ask them the question how they respond to this. So only we should understand how they explain their question. Yeah. Now I tell you uh, about uh, this, uh, what was the tradition of the Holy Quran. It was complete in the life of the Holy Quran. It was revealed in 23 years and uh, it was not written in uh, uh, one shape, uh, in one volume, because it was revealing still the death of the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So it was uh, written after the death of the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So in his life, it is impossible that you compile it in one volume, but it was completed in a written shape in different, uh, for uh, different peoples they have, uh, uh, it's uh, someone have written something and someone have written something and people have le learned it by their heart. What's your they, question? They, Can we get to the question? No, I, I'm telling uh, you that uh, you are telling that this is, was not compiled. I think I've already life. repeated that, did I not already tonight? Huh. What's your question, sir? No, my question, uh, I don't have any question. I'm not agree with your uh, oh, okay. thinking. No, that's so fine. I'm telling that it was completed in the life and people learned by heart it when there was a uh, when, was part, the mood. when was it so, written down? It, all people there, there was a system. He has appointed some person. And where he, is that manuscript? He, he told them to memorize these, they uh, recite this Holy Quran in their prayer. And in Ramadan, the whole Quran Sir, was. I'm asking repeated. you a question. Since you're not asking me a question, let me ask you. Where is that manuscript that you just say was written down? Where is it? It, it, it was uh, uh, written uh, later in the time of the Abu Bakr Siddiq, Razi Allah Ta'ala no, when he came to said that in a one bath, there was 500 bath was uh, martyred. So Sir, let me ask you again. I'm now asking you a third time. Where is that manuscript that you say was written down? In the time of the Abu Bakr Siddiq. Where is it today? Yes, it, this is the same uh, that was. Where is it today? Do you know where it is? Can you show me that manuscript that you're talking about? A complete no, here manuscript? I cannot, here I cannot show. Does it exist this, today? This, this is a, a study and claim, and uh, you can study this one. Can so you tell me is, where there's so a manuscript it, it today? Is, it was uh, totally, completely memorized by the Muslim. And, and it the is a tradition. It, it, it is impossible Are you that, following why this that, is a problem? That one Muslims. can satisfy you. Does this it satisfy you what he is saying? Are you some, are you are, are you convinced that this, a memorized text is this sufficient is your, for you? This is your your program, so you cannot uh, satisfy. If you go to a Muslim program, they also have arguments. So if you invite some people, we did invite. We, we wanted this to be a invite. debate. We should learn each other. Sir, listen. There should not be a debate. Sir, I, I, and I understand the frustration. I can see that that's a problem. But can you see why we're asking these questions? It's very important that all of us in every uh, in every religion who have a text that is historical, that if we're gonna make a claim, support it with manuscript evidence like this, what we've just asked you. The manuscript evidence does not exist for the Quran, not from the seventh century. The manuscript evidence for the Quran only begins to appear in the eighth century. 
those manuscripts, like the Tokap, the Samarkand, the Mahir, the Husseini, the Spetopanus, and the Sana manuscript, these six major manuscripts that are, are the oldest manuscripts, not one of them is from the 7th century, they are all from the 8th and 9th century, they are not the same, they are not complete, and they do not parallel the Quran we have today. Now that is a historical fact. So when you say that they memorized it, I don't care dimness what, because I have no idea what they memorized. If I were to ask you today to tell me what Surah 2, Ayah 145 is, and you repeat it word for word, how do I know you're correct? Unless I have a Quran next to me to follow you to know that that is correct. You need to have a written text to be able to measure everyone around the world to know that they have the same memory. That's all we're asking. We're asking a very simple question. Please stop claiming that it was complete. Please stop complaining. Uh, 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 claiming that it comes from Muhammad. Please stop even claiming it comes from Uthman unless you can support that. And I've asked now three times, where is one manuscript that is complete and unchanged from the time of Uthman? Sir. Hello. I just want to ask you, this PowerPoint, you are the one who designed this one? These are my PowerPoints, yeah. Yeah, you designed this one, yeah. right? Everything you designed in here, right? I'm I sorry? Said, I said, is there any, every page or every design, you are the one make, who make this one, this PowerPoint, right? The PowerPoint, but I did none of the research. No, I'm just asking you, you are the one design this PowerPoint. I did it, this is my PowerPoint, yeah, you can have it, yes. Yeah, you, you make this one, right? Yes. Yeah, I don't know, I'm very poor in, uh, of course I'm Muslim, but I don't have much knowledge of yes. Islam also. Okay, but I just want to, uh, I'm wondering just I hear from you this all things and uh, uh, maybe this is true but you lie all in front of all these people that I don't know this paper why going down when you just show the some Quran uh, words you throw like a rubbish you take a paper like a rubbish and throw in the dustbin just show you in this PowerPoint that oh, you said, oh, I don't know what's happening here. Oh, this I see you like that animated. That was not my animation. I think this, this is... No, no, just that. you, just you. No, this is not how... Yeah, I asked, no, no, I asked, this sorry, one you I... design. This one you accept, this one you design, right? Oh, okay. You're talking about the crunching up. No, no, yeah. yeah. Listen to me. You that design... That shouldn't happen. I don't know why. Except, listen to me. You accept that you design this one, right? Of course, that is a designing, and you are the one make this one. Yeah. And you lie in front of all people. I don't know what's happening. This one, this is the laptop. I have lied. What have I lied tonight? No, you said this is. Uh, you said I don't know what's happening. And yeah, so we said you said this. I don't know what's happening. This one. This is by the borrowed laptop. And this is not. So that was not. That is not. That is not mistake of laptop. That is mistake of. When we make this one, you should respect us. Um, okay? Absolutely, and that's why I'm Problem sorry. Problem is, there are some things not respected. I, I, I don't know about anything what you speak, but I know you lie once thing in front of all people. So I cannot leave you till I don't have knowledge about this. Okay, so thank you. Just, Are there any other questions, folks? Uh, one question. You ask uh, that uh, Quran claims that Maryam is uh, the sister of Imran. Uh, uh, Aaron, Please. sister of Imran. Yeah. Is claimed there that this uh, Aaron is the brother of Musa? Does yes. absolutely because, because Mary... they are, they, they, at that place there are so many Arabs. Not exactly uh, that this uh, that Quran is not claiming that as he is claim is, is claiming that Maryam is sister of Aaron, but it, it is not claiming that this Aaron is the brother of Moses. Does Mary have this, a brother this is named Aaron? An, this, another place, another place, but here. It is your misinterpretation that this Aaron Quran is claiming that this is the uh, Aaron of Mo brother of Moses. That's a great. Uh, that's a, you have that opinion, sir. But it's not just Aaron. It's also Imran, Amran, who is the father of both Mary, Mary, and Aaron and Moses. It's the all three are there. That's why it's obviously that there's a mis. That yes, they have mixed up. Aaron, I think not said that Aaron is the brother of Moses. Maybe they, any other Aaron. Okay. No, there's no, we know Mary didn't have a brother named Aaron. Okay, folks, I think we've completed our questioning for tonight. I want to thank you for coming here. This is, uh, this is going up on YouTube. We are going to make sure that Muslims around the world see this. Hundreds of thousands, or almost half a million, have watched the debate that we did in 2014. Tomorrow, we're going to unpack Islamic slavery. This is the big elephant that no one's talked about. 
We're going to look at the statistics of what Islam has done with slavery. We're going to look at some of the original texts. We're going to look at the quotations of some of the great men of Islam, what they said about black people. And it's not pleasant hearing. And then we're going to look at the numbers. We're going to look at how many slaves were enslaved by Islam versus how many slaves were enslaved by the Europeans. And then we're going to ask which were the people that abolished slavery. Has there ever been an abolition movement within Islam? These are hard-hitting questions. We're doing this purposely because no one has dared to yet ask the historical questions on slavery. That's tomorrow night, and I'll I'll ask you uh, where that where that's going to be, what church that's at. If you can say where it is tomorrow night, and the time. Is that the Island Evangelical Community Church? Yes. Huh? Yes. Yeah, you can say where that was. Yeah, it's the Island Evangelical Community Church. 